I don't know why Lowell left the room because Lowell was just telling me um, I was going to make fun of him because he, um, he's here he's back. So, you know, Lowell had his time for a talk this morning and gave a speech, but he's decided that he didn't say enough. So to welcome him back to the stage to give a second draft of his speech, here's Lowell Bergman. Well, I got, I got carried away, as you might imagine, and so I forgot everything that I wrote down that I was supposed to do. Um, but I'm, uh, I just want to say for the, for the record, and one of the reasons I'm optimistic personally um, about the future of the IRP and the, all the other activities and events that we have is because of our staff, of our permanent staff. And uh, Chris Bush and... Janice Huey, for example, are responsible for what we're doing right now, the symposium. They put this together. And they had the support of Zach Stauffer, Garrett Theroff, Jason Palladino, Loy Almiron, and Patricia Laveau Davis, uh, and of course, the leadership of John Temple. Give them all a hand, please. And, and this symposium itself, the, at least the finances of it and, and the future of it, uh, in the run-up to my, um, let's say, change of status, I had a meeting with the, uh, with the Logan brothers and communication between them, and they collectively will underwrite the program for at least the next five years. And there's more, but I'll get to that later. <laughs> the, th the third draft will be after this session. <laughs> so welcome back. Uh, that was an incredible morning session, and uh, three uh, journalists that I really wanted to hear from, and I feel the same way about this afternoon. So it's, uh, I, I, I want to uh, turn it over now to Al Letson, who's going to be the host. Al is the host of the investigative podcast Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting. <laughs> Uh, his radio show just won a DuPont and a Pete body for Kept Out, an investigation of current day redlining. And uh, Al will introduce the finalists, and it's great to have the, the panelists, the finalists. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, is it hot in here to you guys? It's hot. I'm going to take my jacket off. Thank you, Amy. I, I'm looking directly at She's like, yes, take your jacket off, Al. <laughs> Still bossing me around. <laughs> no, so... Um, Today on the panel, I have with me Madeline Barron. Y'all give it up. She's an investigative reporter and producer with APM Reports and the host of In the Dark. And then next to her is Emmanuel Jochi. He is the phenomenal producer that helped put together Serial Season 3. And next to him is Andy Mills, producer and reporter, New York Times. He worked on Caliphate. He's amazing. Give it up. So uh, we're going to start off uh, with a little clip from Madeline's series, In the Dark, Season 2. If we could roll that now. In February of last year, I got an email from a woman in Mississippi. She wrote that there was a man there named Curtis Flowers, who'd been tried six times for the same crime. The evidence is iffy at best, she wrote. The man didn't have a chance. Curtis Giovanni Flowers murdered those four people. There's no doubt in my mind. And I think he needs to fry in hell where he's going. If he was executed, would you go watch? you damn right I'd go watch. I will stick the needle in him. Ten minutes after it happened, they, they zeroed in on Curtis and never looked nowhere else. I mean, it's hard to trust this investigation. It's hard to trust the people who ran it. And it's hard to trust the prosecution trying this case. Hey, where are the facts? Where's the proof? Mississippi, Mississippi, you know, we all know what goes on in Mississippi. 
Once we get you in the courtroom, you ours. If you're black, we got you. They'll keep going on until they get inside your head to make you think that he really has something to do with it. Did I lead you to say anything? No. Was your statement free and voluntary? Yes. If you try a man six times for the same crime, that something is wrong about the entire system. So are you confident that you have the right person, that Curtis Flowers is guilty? That I will answer definitely, no question at all. So Madeline, what drew you to this story? So this story began as a tip um, after season one of In the Dark. We got hundreds or thousands of tips. One of the shortest ones was an email from this woman who just said, there's this man in Mississippi who's been tried six times for the same crime. She called the evidence against him iffy, but she said he didn't have a chance. And my first reaction as a reporter was like, this is not true. There's no way he's been tried six times. It's like one of these tips you get that is not intentionally false, but they just don't understand. And we looked into it, it was true. And so for us right away, what got our attention as an investigative reporting team was not the details of the crime um, that he was accused of, this quadruple murder in 1996 in the small town, but instead the power of the prosecutor. Like how could someone be tried six times for the same crime? And so when, what does it say that a prosecutor could do that? Because the reason Curtis was tried so many times was because he kept being convicted by an all white or mostly white jury. He would appeal his conviction, he would win because the higher court would find the prosecutor had committed misconduct, but the prosecutor was never removed from the case because he was the elected district attorney. So the same prosecutor would just try the case again, another conviction, another death sentence, another overturned verdict because of prosecutorial misconduct, um, and on and on through six trials. And so for us, it was this, this opportunity, I guess, um, to look at the power of the prosecutor, but also a lot of other um, a lot of other issues that are going on too in the story as well. Now I want to go to uh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you spent a year reporting on the Cleveland justice system. Uh, let's hear a clip from that right now. And this is uh, the clip where you're hanging out with a judge for? Yeah, I'm based in the judge's courtroom. Okay. Uh, yeah. I spent about five months off and on watching cases in Judge Gould's courtroom. Uh, thanks very much. I'd like to have a record 6117. And so I can say with confidence that this is a typical day. Do you have any common sense at all, dude? Why didn't you just pull over? Also, Most of what's happening in Judge Gould's courtroom, in any courtroom, are pleas and sentencings. Trials are the exception. So this one I'm starting with, a sentencing for a 19-year-old I'm going to call Terrell, isn't unusual in any way. Terrell was caught driving a stolen car. He led the police in a chase. He'd been guilty about a month earlier. And now he was back in front of Judge Gould for sentencing. Okay, so let's back up for a second here. Please tell me who's in the courtroom. Is that your mother in the far corner to the left? Yes, sir. Hi, how are you today? Terrell's family is sitting back there, which is usually a good thing for a defendant. It's meant to telegraph that there are people who can keep the defendant in line should he or she be released. Who else is here with your mother? His sister? Okay, hi, how are you? Judge Gould greets Terrell's sister and another sister and brother then turns back to Terrell, starts to churn out a lecture anyone with better behaved siblings has heard. When you're not in jail, do you live with those fine people? Yes. Well, that's too bad for them, isn't it? Because you've been pretty much of a bad guy. Your two nice sisters and your nice brother, they don't have these problems, do they? But you bring grief to their door, don't you? Don't you? You tell me. Judge Gould looks at Terrell's PSI, pre-sentencing investigation, which is details about Terrell's background. Is your father in the picture? I see him, Terrell says. Where, what, what does that mean? We don't live together. They were divorced when you were five. Correcto? Yes. Does your father have a criminal record? Terrell says, not that I know of. Has he been to the penitentiary? He's a decent guy. What's he do for a living? You don't know him, you don't know him well. He sort of deserted you in the family, right? Are your brothers and sisters full brothers and sisters or stepsisters? Full brothers and sisters. And your parents divorced when you were five? Is that correct? If you're hearing a sharp note of, I don't know, racial stereotyping in Judge Gould's questions, <laughs> an assumption on the part of the judge that this black family is rudderless and unstable, that all these kids must be from different, possibly incarcerated fathers, yeah. I'm guessing Terrell hears it too. (laughs) 
just listening to that clip, the thing that kept coming to mind for me is like, how did you do that for five months? <laughs> <laughs> five months! I mean, one of the things that we, we tried to do with our, our season was we wanted to just, and you know, just referencing what people said earlier about that distance we sometimes have as investigative journalists in terms of finding stories that will explain our system, that, you know, give you a good central character to root for that, like, you know, are exceptional. We wanted to find very ordinary things. To be quite honest, it was easy to sit in that courtroom because so much of what happened there on a daily basis was mind-numbingly boring. Um, but I think what you'd see so much in some of the minutiae of like these different court proceedings was you began to see patterns. And so month after month, like week after week sitting in that courtroom, I could begin to sort of predict, okay, these are the questions that this judge is going to ask. These are the things that this defendant needs to do for these sentencings. Um, and that's the thing. This, is, this was not a, a major case. Nobody knew like, about this case in like, the local media. And you know, for the most part, um, you know, not to spoil it if you haven't listened to the podcast, but you know, that defendant actually ends up getting an outcome that he and his attorney are happy about. And so when you look on a docket and you see, like, you know, that someone pled and received, like, a certain amount of time, I think the thing that I noticed just sitting in these courtrooms was just realizing there's so much more behind that. We're not even investigating the process of how we get from point A to B in a sentencing. And unfortunately, in that courtroom, every day from 10 to 4, the process sounds like that. And Andy, uh, Calivate, you guys wanted to understand how someone got into ISIS, why they stay in ISIS, and how ISIS operates. And you had somebody that actually responded to you who's willing to talk. And let's hear, hear some uh, tape of that. This is the recruit. This is when he's explaining to you how he got recruited, correct? It's like when we first meet him. Right, okay. Yeah. Chapter two, recruitment. All right. Take me back to the hotel. Yeah. So we've been waiting there for almost two hours. How are you? Thank you for coming. And then the guy that we're going to call Abu Hussefa finally showed up. Traffic is a little bit like peak hour two. Yeah. And we sat down on the couch. Wait, what did you want him to sit here? Um, the room's a little echoey, so I was... Well, yeah. As we sit down with him. Yeah. Can you just let me know what's going on in your head? Like, what is it sitting there in the hotel you're wanting to know? So if this guy is who he says he is, then there's an enormous amount that I think I can learn from him because I've spent the better part of a year researching the very arm of ISIS that he claims to have belonged to. But before we can even get there, I need to figure out, is he for real? Can I ask your date of birth? Yeah, 1994. And is it okay with you if we say that you're from Canada? But just Whenever you're talking to members of the Islamic State, and specifically Western recruits who have returned to their home countries, it's almost impossible to fact check every statement that they say. And that's because these things happen in a part of the world and in a part of the internet that are almost entirely sealed off. Can I ask what your parents do for, for a living? Yeah, my dad, um, he runs a restaurant. And my mom does not work. She used to be an esthetician. So what I'm trying to do is see if what he tells me matches up with the reporting I have done and with the pattern of behavior that we know is typical of recruits of this terrorist entity. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I'm the oldest. I have a younger brother and a sister that's in the middle. Could you just describe what, what your life was like growing up? It'd be pretty boring. You know, just a normal family. Uh, my dad would be at work most of the time. So I'd be with my mom. So in many ways, his background is typical to so many others that I have spoken to. He was neither rich nor poor. He was from basically a, you know, a middle class uh, background. He loved video games, Star Wars. Star Wars, well, still I'm a big fan of it. He's from a Pakistani immigrant household. Yeah, I was a natural born Muslim. I was born into a Muslim family. And you know, was, I've learned from my family the basics, the prayers, the reading the Quran and everything. His family was not particularly religious at least outwardly. His mother was not veiled. Uh, he had a younger sister. She too was not veiled. Did you feel treated badly as a Muslim? Did you feel in your own experience here in Canada that, that you had been humiliated or treated in, in, some, in some way that slighted you? Oh no, that wasn't, that, that wasn't it at all. Like, that was, I don't think that was a factor at all, that I was persecuted back here in Canada because of my religion. My sister, my mom, they've always been able to walk the streets safe. Everyone's really nice. Uh, the, my dad gets along with everyone that comes by to his restaurant. 
and it's just, you know, they're living a pretty good life here. But me, on the other hand, I always wanted something bigger. I've always wanted like something, not something simple and boring. Andy, thinking about your career trajectory, right? You spent a, a bit of time at Radiolab. What's the transition like going from a place like Radiolab, which like does some investigative stuff, but you know, Radiolab is, is really different from what the type of work you had to do with Caliphate. Like, what was that transition like? Hmm, it was interesting. And I think to explain it, I had to go back to like, when I was looking to leave Radiolab, I was curious about doing stuff that was more hard hitting investigations, journalism, <clears throat> the 2016 election, if anyone remembers that chapter <laughs> that was going on. Um, and I felt like I wanted to get in the game. Uh, and, I, and I also was frustrated at seeing both a, uh, a lot of biased journalism, especially online, uh, kind of the clickbait journalism, and then seeing a lot of growing distrust, especially I'm from the Midwest and the South, a lot of gr growing distrust with like the mainstream media. And I was like, I, I, I also have critiques of the mainstream media. I want to be a part of making it better and looking to, to see what my next move would be. And uh, I was surprised whenever the New York Times brought me in to, uh, to interview there that what they were asking themselves is like, how should the New York Times sound? They had had chat podcasts for like 10 years, but they were saying something's different and interesting happening in the podcast space right now. And we want to get in on it, but like, you know, the first question is just how should it sound? And Lisa Tobin, Sam Dolnick, and myself, we were, and, and Samantha Hennig, we were kind of in those early meetings trying to, to solve that problem. And, and one of the things that we did at Radiolab that I really liked is that we tried to capture a moment of discovery. Like the, the best episodes of Radiolab, uh, for those of you who haven't heard it, you should check it out. It's a very good podcast. Um, especially the old episodes, I'm just saying it really. <laughs> <laughs> you see my name in the credits, you're gonna love it. Um, mostly joking. Uh, the, no, the, 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 those, those episodes, they had ability to, to find this moment of discovery in something that maybe seemed boring, like a, like a scientific experiment, and help you see the, the wonder that was there in that moment and how complicated it makes things when you discover things. And then, of course, there's the role of doubt. There's no certainties in science, and there's also a, not often a lot of certainties in journalism. And so we did try in those early stages of thinking of what we were going to make together which eventually would become Caliphate and The Daily, that like, we wanted to, to build off that same model, to say that like, let's pair up with the work of journalism. Let's show the work that journalists are doing in part to help gain people's trust as it's, as it's eroding, but also as a storytelling device to say that like, there's an amazing uh, a connection that you could draw between the, the listener to the podcast and the reporter who's doing the reporting when they can, they can actually be there the moment that they learned the thing that they would later put into the, the newspaper or put online. So that was, that, like, that's like the, the DNA of what we've made at uh, the New York Times is so connected to what Jed and Robert and Soren and the crew at Radio Lab are doing in a lot of ways. One of the things I think about when it comes to all three of your podcasts is that you're really clear about your reporting process. You really... Uh, find ways to let the audience in on how you do it and what you do it uh, or, and, and, and why you're doing it. Um, and I think that when I read investigative journalism like on paper, I don't see that transparency as much. I just see like the facts and the story and how you build it. Are you guys consciously thinking about like how you let the audience in to the reporting process? I mean, I, Madeline, I was... Um, I remember listening to In the Dark and just being blown away at you guys going into uh, all these different little rooms where these documents were at. I was grossed out, like thinking about all the mold and nasty spiders in there, all of it. Like, but you guys brought me with you. I mean, talk to me about the decisions to do that type of thing. Yeah, so this is something we think about a lot. So with our, the biggest data analysis or gathering we did for season two is we were trying to answer this question does the district attorney disproportionately strike African Americans from juries, not just in Curtis Lauer's case, but in all trials since he was elected in 1991? And so to do that, we needed to gather data. And so you can, and the answer was yes, he does disproportionately strike people at four and a half times the rate. So if you're black, you're four and a half times the rate. So a lot of times I think a traditional investigative piece would say something like, APM reports conducted a year-long investigation and reviewed these documents and concluded that XXX 4.5 times the rate. 
What I think it, you can do differently in podcasting or in documentary film is to like work your way up to that moment and make it a suspenseful moment for two reasons. One is just as a narrative. It's like we don't want to tell someone some fact before they even care about it. And then it's just like has this like homework quality to it. We want at the point where we tell you what the rate is, we want you to be at the edge of your seat wanting to know what how, tell me what it is. I want the number. And you know, you know you've done your job if you've made it matter that much that people want to know the number. And the other reason too is to show um, in this case, you know, this information should have been easy to find. You know, it should be easy, you'd think, in a democracy. To, so the clerk could very easily just mark the race of people, mark the jury strikes, and we could have gone to the courthouse and just found this out and then gone home. The reality was um, that nobody even tracked how many trials are happening here. And Parker Yesko is in the middle of this room, and she's the one on our team who bought a handheld scanner and went to these courthouses in north central Mississippi for months just scanning documents, scanning more than 100,000 pages of documents. Um, and then giving, giving those documents to Will Craft, our data reporter, who spent months analyzing them. And so we had this a tremendous amount of work, and we didn't think it was a good idea to just sum it up that way, you know, to just say four and a half times the rate. We also, one of the things we found by showing people, like, the process, you know, in very condensed form, but Parker's scanning, 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 her life is terrible, you know, like, you can only imagine, like, you know, <laughs> sorry, Parker, but it's true. You know, I mean, like, if literally all you're doing every day is, is, like, waking up in the morning, driving to a courthouse and scanning documents until the courthouse closes, and then you're doing the next thing that next day. It, one of the things that it did is it helped, I think, our listeners understand what in the world this strange thing called investigative reporting is. You know, what are we talking about when we say we need a year-long investigation? What is that about? Mm -hmm. And you can really see what that's about in season two, I hope. That, that is, that's just how long it takes to scan on even the best, like, most high-quality scanner we could find, and if you need an endorsement, let us know. It was but, you know, but, but seriously, and then, and then people could say to us, you know, that's why I value this work. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, was, it was demystifying, but also, like, great storytelling. Like, mm -hmm. it, it really let the listener in to exactly the type of work that goes into hardcore investigative reporting. And then when you think about wanting people to support your work, like right. listeners, or understanding the value of, like, having an investigative reporter in a local newsroom versus not, you hopefully you can make a case for it. Yeah. Emmanuel, how about you? I think for us, um, we would think it in similar lines, but also I think one of our biggest challenges um, right from the very beginning was we're going to be using, over the course of like these nine episodes that were a season, we're going to be talking about some really boring things and using a lot of legalese. And like, how can we come up with creative ways just to educate people? So we kind of followed a structure for our season where, you know, the beginning we saw episodes like in Judge Gould's courtroom where we're showing you how these proceedings work. And you're, sh you're being told these things from my perspective as I'm sitting there watching it, doing my job, right? So that the hope is by the end, by the time we get to episode seven or eight, we don't have to pause on those things. You know exactly what's supposed to happen. When I say sentencing, you know that there's going to be some sort of back and forth like that. And I think we just tried to make sure that when we were, where we could, we could use our storytelling to just like skip some of those huge sort of like explainer paragraphs, which is, okay, this is what a plea means, or this is what a pre-sentencing investigation means, just by, you know, okay, basically hearing me flounder around in the dark on the air trying to figure something out um, as we went along. Andy, one of the things that I thought about a lot in listening to Caliphate is that in a lot of ways you guys, you, were doing something similar to what you do on the daily, uh, as in like you have um, the host interviewing a journalist and they're giving a story, right? A two-way. But what you and uh, Rukmini were able to do was that you're, when you were interviewing her and going back and forth, it felt atmospheric. Like the music and the way you scored it, the way you talked to her. Sometimes like you were off the mic and just asking her a question in a way that like, you know, I would never do a reveal or we would never do, you'd never hear that really on the daily. But the way you did it kind of built a whole atmosphere around it. Like, I felt like I was in this weird netherworld with the two of you while you're talking. I love to hear you say that. That's great. <laughs> um, was, that, was that intentional? Was it, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, because The Daily was uh, a hit, I think I got a little bit more freedom with Caliphate than I would have <laughs> otherwise. They were like, and also that was like a whole lot of work. Because Caliphate uh, that, feels that we weird in certain places. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's, 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 it's intentionally it's, weird. And I had great editors who encouraged the weird. And then Sam Dolnick, who's um, really great from the 
the, the top level at the New York Times to encourage more odd sounding things. I mean, look, podcasts are very new. Um, they're, they're a young medium, and I think about them sometimes in the terms of like when, when film was new, that mainly film was like uh, you set up a camera in the audience of a play, and you just filmed a play, and the distance from the actors was like similar to the distance from an audience to a play. And then over the 20th century, these filmmakers like Hitchcock are like, I'm going to put a camera right behind someone and messing with perspective. And of course, like, we're just now getting to experiment. It's like the exciting thing about being in this medium right now when we are is that we get to be the ones who get to, to experiment with the form. And then I think that because the stakes were high and because Rukmini was such an interesting character, we were allowed to experiment a little bit more than most would on, on Caliphate. And so for me, I don't know who here saw... Um, uh, uh, True Detective season one, the one, mm-hmm. with, the good the, one. Yeah, the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure they were all uh, they were all good in their own way. They were, but uh, it was really good. Uh, I was so one of the things that we we have we have to have people talking in podcasts. That's like an essential part of it. And so, who are they talking to? And at Radio Lab, Jed and Robert are kind of having this psychedelic conversation, and then producers come in, and sometimes they're talking to you, but they're sometimes talking to each other. At the Daily, it's like Michael talks to you at the beginning, and then it's just you're listening in on Michael, a reporter at the New York Times, having a conversation with another reporter at the New York Times about the news and sometimes the making of the news. And we're like, there's something to that. And then we try to evolve it one step further, where it's like when you watch True Detective season one, uh, right there at the beginning, you have this, you, this, 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 this great storytelling device because there's a, there's a camera on Rust Cole and he starts referring to something that you don't know, some case from 1992. And you're in the present with a character who's remembering the past, but then there's going to be stuff that happens in the present and the two times come together. And I found myself in a very similar situation where uh, Rukmini and I had had this really, as, you know, as a journalist, like you sometimes have those once-in-a-lifetime interviews where we had sat down with a former ISIS member who said too much and opened up and got emotional with us. And we came back and we're like, that event is actually the event of this podcast, but we're gonna, eventually we're going to go to Iraq and we're going to have to fact-check that. Eventually we're going to go from the story that's taking place in the past to like now we're in the, in the present. And so... Uh, just this is like real podcast nerd stuff, but like <laughs> when you're talking about like the microphone, the atmosphere, like I intentionally interviewed her with a shotgun mic, like in a room, so you hear the back and forth because I wanted it to feel the way that that camera, that 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 the camera feels when it's on Rust Cole, the detective remembering the story. And so in, there's no host in Caliphate. There's no one who says welcome to Caliphate to, on today's episode. You just you're just the, we hit play on the tape where I'm like. So take me back. What happened? Um, some people really hated that. I just want to throw that out there. That like, <laughs> I sound really confident up here. Like, that it definitely didn't, people didn't like it. But um, I think where we failed, we failed forward in, in mm-hmm. ways that'll be mm-hmm. uh, like helpful going forward. And, and, and trying to think of how to be more expressive and artistic. And uh, and and um, I can't put a period on that sentence. I'm really sorry. I, I will I cut you off, of and we'll keep going. <laughs> So, Madeline and Emmanuel, this question uh, is for you two primarily. Um, when we think about journalism in America, you know, just to be really honest, and this may make some people in the room uncomfortable, but I don't care. Um, in journalism, a lot of times, black lives do not matter. Black lives don't have the same weight as white lives do. Um, you can look at like pretty much any publication, listen to podcasts or whatever, and we can try to understand like how uh, this group of people is and that group of people is. But when it comes to like the way black folks have to uh, operate and live in the United States, it feels a lot of times like it's not a story, i.e. Mississippi's just going to do what Mississippi does. And so I don't know why we should tell that story about Curtis Flowers because everybody knows that Mississippi is racist or i.e. the justice system is going to do what the justice system does. I don't know why we would spend a year in a courtroom to find out that black people are treated differently than white people are in courtrooms because we already know that. What's the story? And so, um, which obviously drives me nuts. Like there is a rage in me right now. I could hulk out when I think about it. So, um, serious. I hulk out in meetings all the time. Ask anybody <laughs> a reveal. Um, so, I'm, I'm curious, like... Um, how did you navigate that? Like, how do you make, because just being really honest, like a lot of the people that are listening to 
narrative podcasts tend not to be African Americans, right? So you're, you're reaching out to an audience that doesn't have that experience. How do you make them care? How do you get people to, to tune in? Uh, and, and did you think about those things when you were going into this? Yeah. I mean, honestly, what's interesting about that is that um, that premise that like black people suffering is something that we're just okay with, generally. Um, I feel like it was kind of at the heart, I mean that was, I feel like one of the things that we, we really wanted to hit on and make really the center focus of like a lot of the stories that we covered during the season. Time and time again, I feel like one of the things that we'd hear from people in interviews, even just really early on, was just like, oh, well like, this thing that this person endured, you know, like, that's, that's fine, that's fine for them, because there is a them and there is an us. Um, East Cleveland, this municipality that we covered towards the end of the season, and we sort of did an investigation of their police department and the way in which they had treated like a victim of police abuse there. Like one of the over- overarching reactions to our reporting in Cleveland was just kind of like, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't know, I mean, it's something that makes me really angry. I, I think to some extent I, I don't know what to do with that. But I think what helped for us is that Cleveland as a place is like a blue dog city. The judge you heard earlier is a Democrat. He was re-elected as part of like the blue wave in Cuyahoga County and around the country like last fall and by overarching margin, right? And so it was very, I felt like it was instructive to sort of point to people and then zoom out and say, oh, oh, well, that guy you just heard in that clip, he's the average for this building. The only difference between him and a judge on another floor is that he's just saying the things that the other judges are thinking out loud when he doesn't have to. And I feel like pointing out those things again and again and again, saying everyone in this room, people like you, people that you feel like you would connect with, all of them think that this is normal. Um, And that you probably, if you were working in these situations, would think this is normal. Because we do. Um, And yeah, I, I feel like there's not, I feel like there's not like a silver bullet. If I had it, I would be out there making that thing and <laughs> I would feel a lot better about the state of the world. Um, but I feel like just calling out like the similarities, making the listener connect with the people who are the so-called villains in your story so that they see themselves and they see how their actions are impacting black communities, I feel like is, is probably the best I've found so far. Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the things that was happening that was interesting after the podcast came out is so we were reporting in a town of like 3,000 people, Winona, Mississippi, and our presence there was how people felt about it, it broke down in the ways you would expect based on race. White people generally thought there weren't problems with the criminal justice system. They didn't like us being there. African Americans thought there were problems with the criminal justice system. We're glad that people were there reporting on it. Um, but we weren't sure if anyone was going to listen to the podcast when it came out. And what was interesting is that Lots of people listen to the podcast in the town, and one of the, and we went back, and we've been back a lot since then, and one of the more meaningful comments that I heard was someone who said, like, just, was just talking about the feeling of when a journalist never shows up in your town. Like, this guy was telling me, like, you know, people just, like, written this, us off entirely. Like, like, it's so, like, to your point, you know, it's, like, so boring or obvious that like nobody's even going to come to the state of Mississippi to do any reporting. And so just being glad that like just that there is reporting like that, you know, for a lot of people listening to it was reflecting back stuff that they already knew, but there was a still a value in documenting this. And I think that, you know, one of the white perspectives that we heard a lot of in Mississippi was this like was it's like getting at what you're talking about. It's like you don't have a right to investigate us or, you know, like, or, and then, you know, other people saying, well, you know, what about in the North or something? And so somehow like, the whole Southern part of the United States can avoid scrutiny in this way. And so we thought it was an interesting conversation always in, in, in our meetings and stuff about to what extent, you know, to highlight the Southernness of it and, mm-hmm. or to not. Um, but I think that there was Southernness there that, ma- that really mattered to the story. Um, and I guess what I would encourage is for people to do more reporting in the South and to not be put off by like concerns about like oh it's a southern story I mean it's part of the United States like you know it's tons of people live there I I mean you know the the lack of investigative reporting in Mississippi Jerry Mitchell um, amazing reporter is starting a center for investigative reporting in Mississippi but there's still just not there's just very little investigative reporting in, in that, like, that whole area where we were, for example. There was no. I mean, that, that, that whole idea of you can't report on us because you're not from here was basically weaponized during the civil rights struggle. I mean, that's how they tried to stop people from actually seeing what was going on there. 
Yeah, and that was, I mean, that was some of the exact same types of comments that we got from white people in our story. So Andy, your story, you're really like looking at another culture that's completely different from the way we live our lives here in the United States. And, and I'm, the family of the, uh, the, the Canadian, I can't remember his name. The, um, Abu Huzaifa. Abu. Uh, not his real name. Yeah, uh, Abu, not his real name. His family, like their culture is different, but also like where he comes from, uh, or excuse me, where his parents come from and where he went back to and, and reporting in Iraq. How did you um, adjust your Western eyes to really understand the lives and the way people lived in that part of the world? I mean, and is it, it, I, I guess the question is, is it important to adjust your yeah. Western eyes or are you just reporting specifically for Western listeners? Do you know what I mean? Well, identity definitely is throughout the, the episodes of our series, but they are all tinged in, in colors of gray. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to work with Rukmini Kalamaki is because she's such a singular force. She's, she's uh, an amazing journalist, but she's also just in her identity... She's, she's a refugee. She's an immigrant. She's, she's somebody who is writing and reporting in English, her fourth language that she's ever learned. She's, 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 she's like weird in the best way. And I was drawn to her because I often sometimes feel weird too. Like I'm not from New York in the media world. I'm from that part of the South and parts of the Midwest. And I am very curious about religious thought. And even beyond religious thought, um, Having been somebody who at one time I was a fundamentalist Christian, I really feel like I can, I feel sometimes as if I understand the weight that religious thoughts and then the thoughts that sometimes you think are religious thoughts that are around religion and religious life play. And so actually a big part of the project of Caliphate, you know, for me and Rukmini, who also was raised uh, very similarly uh, in the faith, was just to tell our largely secular audiences that this, these people are not these people. Like there was a while where I was trying to convince our editors to call the the series them, and to say like we other these people. Like oh, who could join the Islamic State? Like who are these people? And then you find out like most of them are like suburbanites and the people who are struggling to find purpose and meaning in their life. People who found identity in religious circles, who found a sense of purpose. People like the, the climactic moment in that episode that you played a segment from is when he sees those awful videos on Facebook that we all saw for a while about what was happening in, in Syria. The, the cell phone footage of, of, of people coming out of the, the rubble and he's feeling like so helpless, like I think a lot of people feel, but by then he was like in the wrong kinds of chat rooms and he was... He didn't do very well in school, and so he's working at this restaurant, and he does, he's like maybe going to be a dentist, and he doesn't want to be a dentist. And like suddenly he's like, these recruiters say, like, you can help that person. And he's like, I want to. And so it's actually something far more not only familiar to us in our culture, um, but it's actually like, it's, it's weirdly like it's almost a, a good part of humanity that got corrupted to, to do this terrible thing. So that's on the one hand. Now, when it comes to like working in Iraq, and then we have... Uh, a couple of episodes that are dedicated to the Yezidi um, community and, and, and the women and girls that survived um, uh, enslavement there. I mean, that was definitely where, um, like, you, you, you have certain limitations. I mean, that's like, so that, that is a, a small minority in a different part of the world and not one that I had ever traveled to uh, before that I knew very much of. And so I, I, I came to that with a lot of research, um, a lot of, like, trying to, to make sure that, um, you know, when we looked at the complicated cases, like the, the women who had been kidnapped by ISIS and then had children from their captors. And we talked a lot about how much of that to bring into the series because that, the relationship between that mother and that child is so hard to just, like, make a chapter inside of a 10-part series about ISIS. You know, I think ultimately we decided that we didn't really want to go there. Mm -hmm. And we had to make decisions like that sometimes that like, that was like, to do it well, we would need to devote so much time to it. Um, and, and like, maybe that's something we'll do later. I'm curious for each one of you, like, what was the biggest challenge in your uh, reporting and how did you get past it? Madeline? Hmm. Gosh. 
feel like this story more than any other one had no like really easy part, like no, <laughs> like, you know, talking, to, I mean, I still haven't talked to Curtis Flowers, you know, his lawyers won't let me talk to him. I mean, talking to people on the phone was not easy. So I just think the combining every last part being difficult, um, and then you have six trials, so you have six opening statements, six closing arguments, you have six versions of all the witness testimony, but so everything just kind of like, Nothing was just like, oh, check that off the list. It was always like, no, there's not one witness, there's 12. But are some of them really witnesses? No. And so that followed through with the writing. Because I think one of the biggest challenges with the kind of work that we do and what I think maybe like I learned a lot from documentary film with is that you do all this work on the investigation side. And then you need to have it matter to people. You need to have the story matter. So we spent so much time taking this complex series of facts that we all know how to gather and think, how can this unfold in a way that is compelling that you want to listen. And you know, we spend you know, months and months and months on that. And I think that what we've seen with podcasting is that you can, through podcasting, make people care about investigative journalism who wouldn't normally listen to NPR or know what NPR is, um, for example, or wouldn't know, like have a Netflix subscription or something. But someone like, says something like, oh, like, check out this thing on my phone that I think is pretty interesting about the criminal justice system. And someone's like, okay, what is that? It's a podcast, whatever. And then all of a sudden, like, we have people now, like, in the dark listeners all across the United States, who are asking these critical questions about their criminal justice system. And so I think it's just a way, like, I would encourage people who are already doing investigative reporting, people in this room, to really think about, like, ways that you can reach more people um, through these different mediums. And so I think the challenge of it is how do you make it work, but that's also the value of it. One of the things you just said is that you, you still haven't talked to Curtis Flowers. And hearing you say it, like, made me go, oh, my God. Yeah, that's right. You never talk. Nope. But you guys did such a great job of... Of not talking to him. Of not talking to him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of brilliant in the sense that, like, like I feel like Curtis is, is my dude. Like, I know Curtis. You know, like, he's that's a gentle that. guy. He's like, you know, like, uh -huh. all the, the way you built it with the different voices... Um, he became a character in the fact, e even though there was an absence of that character. Yeah, he's one of the few people in this whole story that we still haven't talked to. The prison won't let me v visit him or talk to him on the phone. His lawyers won't let him write back to me. So I write to him, and then I hear from his family that he's gotten those letters. His family talks to him all the time, like every day on the phone. So I can like often tell you what Curtis had for breakfast, not today, because they think Parchman's on lockdown. But like, but I can't ever talk. I've never been able to talk to him. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why that story, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why that story had not been told is that, you know, it's like, oh, I can't talk to the main guy. I don't want to do the story. Yeah. So, uh, Emmanuel, uh, biggest challenge, how'd you overcome it? Um, I think my biggest challenge, especially just spending so much time, I mean, I, I, I moved to Cleveland for like the part of a year to, to work on this, um, along with um, our host and my colleague, Sarah. Um, and, you know, I didn't have an office space. I was, like, literally almost, like, living out of the courthouse. I was there every second of every day. And um, I think it was hard not to... I think the thing that was hard is that I felt myself becoming numb to things over time. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, like, I remember the very first time I ever watched somebody be convicted or found guilty of something. What it was like to watch, like... A young black man, I mean, I'm 25 now, I was 22 when we started this project, watching somebody who really is me, <laughs> but for like a couple different turns, watch them get shackled, weigh what that means when they've been shackled, and watch them being taken away. And then only, I don't know, three weeks, a month later, coming to terms with like, oh, do I still feel that same way? Do I still feel all of the sadness and anger and like complicated feelings that come with that? And then being angry at myself for not feeling that. Because really, like, that has what has happened on, in a larger sense in the system. Is that we've gotten used to seeing the usual man in the usual place. And we're fine with what happens to him once he's out of that door and once he's been put away. Um, and I think I just tried to keep reminding myself that that, that could be me. That could be me, and even if it wasn't me, I should, I should care. I should still feel that sense of, of injustice. That, like, one, a crime has been perpetrated against the community. That people are hurting because of this crime. But that those people, that, that hurt and that, that crime has happened on all sides of the equation. 
And I think just constantly reminding myself who went forth was good. And I think it was good in terms of just assessing how peop other people were going to consume this. Um, I feel like one of the things that Serial in the past has entered the public discussion about is like, how, is, how are people consuming these very real stories, these very serious stories and investigations that we're like digging up, essentially. And, you know, one of my biggest concerns was, as a black journalist in particular, am I just digging up a bunch of black pain for people just to like feast upon? You know, people would treat me all the time after some of our stories came out being like, you know, at News Manual, like, just her listened to your story, had to go for a rage walk. And I would just be like, okay, so what did you do after the rage walk? <laughs> yeah. um, you know what I mean? And I, I feel like trying to make decisions, in it, specific decisions in my storytelling, where it's like, okay, I know that people are wanna, gonna hear all the details of how this victim of police brutality was hurt, the way he was hurt, where he was hurt. But I'm not gonna start my story there. Instead, I'm going to talk about what happens to a police victim after they get some of the things that police brutality victims don't get. What happens after the cameras leave and like, the narrative phase around this person? What's that person's life like on a day-to-day -day basis, living in a town with cops that he's taken to court who are now out, who know that he doesn't have a valid driver's license? <laughs> what is that like? And I think just keeping all of those things in mind was super, super challenging to me, especially, quite frankly, as the only full-time black person on that team. Um, I felt like that was like something that I had to keep reminding myself, <laughs> am I, how are we being represented? Am I doing this the right way? Um, and thankfully, at This American Life and around that orbit, there are other black journalists that I could pull in to sort of like help me with that. I sort of had like a brain trust of people where I was like, hey, can I play a piece of tape with you? Hey, can I do this? And that's something that like, you know, as I sit in this room, you know, I, I really hope that those are things that you consider when you hire black journalists onto your teams. It's not just enough to diversify. You have to make sure they're supported. I can't tell you how much it meant to have editors and people who look like me who are like, you're doing the right thing. We're not going to let this be what you're afraid it could be. I think that's really important. Yeah. Absolutely. Andy. Uh, challenges and how you got over it. Well, before I, I just wanted to jump on something that he just said that I think it would be a shame because it gets said, a version of what I'm about to say gets said at like every time podcasts get talked about, but I think that it's, it's still like a new enough conversation that I want to insert it here. But like you saying like that could be me, like that could be me, that could be me over and over and over again. There is something about the people that make podcasts that are like, like we, we're drawn to that. But there's also something about the medium itself, if I could just like pitch it out, that it, it does help people feel in some emotional way connected to the, the subjects of your stories. And I, I have this theory that it's something about the fact that you're often listening to it in headphones and that like, it's kind of like music in some way. Like when, when I hear like Smokey Robinson sing about unrequited love, like I never wonder about Smokey Robinson's unrequited love. I think about my own. You know, like, I, you know, I, like I, you, it, there's something when you, when you use that same mechanism. It's intimate. To, what's that? It's intimate. It's intimate. It's intimate. It's sympathy. And you can, you can finally do that thing that sometimes, even, even like when you're seeing something visually, which can also be very compelling. It could also seem like, but this person looks different me, differently than me. They're like, when, when it's their voice and it's, and it's in their head and they're hearing about the, the granular details of their experience. I love that somebody said that in the last thing, something about like granular. I think it was you, Sarah, who was like, like, you ask granular questions and you get granular answers. And like, we're interested in that and putting the granular experiences of somebody else into the intimate space of somebody's mind. And yeah, I think that that's like why I love this medium and why I hope that we're only at the beginning of it, of it growing. As far as difficulties, I think mine in some ways I can't talk about because I get a little teary-eyed because <laughs> I'm like a real weeper uh, as, a, as a human. Uh, it's I, all right, I'll hug you. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> just go with it, man. Yeah. Give it to uh, us. <laughs> I'm here for you. It's just you and me. Yeah. It's a safe space. Yeah. But no, like uh, there, there are people who are like really hurting in other parts of the world. Yeah. And to see that and come back and see how good we have it, but then to realize that, like, 
they're not just victims and like we have problems too. We should deal with our problems. Like that balance is like in me every day, like oh, tweet me part. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. You like one second you're sitting there with somebody and they're telling you about ah. what it's like to be a slave for years. And then like two weeks later, you're on your bike and you're going to Manhattan and like the bus almost hits you and you're like, holy shit, man, watch out for me in my bike lane. Like they both matter. I hope I don't get hit by a bus as I'm traveling to, to work. But also like you open up Twitter and you see what people are mad about. Yeah. And you're just like, I want to shake you. Like there's real pain. There's real, it's, it's like, it's, it's not just that it's the proportion that's different. It's actually a more interesting story. Like, the celebrity shit that we're so into, and like the stuff that we're doing on Twitter, it's just, it's a plague on our attention. We could be using the, 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 the attention that we have. Mm-hmm. And like, <laughs> I'm just saying, no, I'm totally talking to myself too. Like, I, I, <laughs> like I'm not <laughs> preaching something like, well, you look at how many Game of Thrones theories thing I read versus this, like, I have my own issues I gotta deal with, but like, uh, <laughs> I think that like, it's really hard to understand how we're supposed to um, continue to, to care about this many things. Living in a globalized world and, 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 and seeing every day what's in our newspaper at the New York Times and just to, to try and find the right proportion of taking care of yourself and being aware that there's only a certain amount of power and attention that you have in this world and you want to use it wisely. And then also being like, you should challenge yourself, you know, to, to, to think bigger than your own backyard and to make sure that you're not um, pitying yourself in your own situations, even though it might be in some ways pitiful, the situation you're in. And I just, I, I can't figure it out. But. I, um, I won't call it a debate or an argument, but me and uh, one of my coworkers who is an amazing journalist, I love him to death uh, and I love working with him, but him and I have been going back and forth in this conversation. And I say that I want to do journalism um, because I want things to change. That like my my bottom line is that I believe that um, the only way things will ever change in this country, in this world, is if we actually know what's happening. And so I want to arm people with that information to go out and make change. To like it's my way of like trying to make the world a better place. And his response would be like, yeah, I'm, I, I just want to give, I just want to find out everything there is to find out and put it out there and not really have like an end goal of like his, he thinks that his job as a reporter is to do, to do that, to like uncover things and leave it out there in the open and whatever happens, happens. Um, and, you know, I was like, oh, God, and so many journalists are like that. And I, I, and I respect it. It's just really different from the way that I, I look at like the job that, I'm here to do and what um, and I you know I would also say that like I don't I'm not saying that everybody at Reveal obviously I'm saying that like somebody that I work with at Reveal disagrees with that um, so not everybody in the organization is is moving in that direction but I think we're all trying to like get to the truth right um, and I'm curious like when you guys think about the work that you're doing because all of the work that you're doing um, they have these characters in the center of it that like I don't I just don't know how you could spend that much time with somebody and their story and not get emotionally invested and want some kind of change to happen. And I'm just curious um, how you guys see that. I feel like I'm somewhere in between what you're talking about. Um, Because what I always think about is, you know, a really depressing research idea is to go look at like newspaper archives and see how many amazing stories have been reported and nothing happened. And so if you're in it, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> you know, which is like most stories probably. And so I think there's this role of the reporter is kind of like the, in some ways, you know, sometimes, I mean, Curtis Flowers' case right now is before the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, sometime between now and the end of June, they'll decide whether to overturn his conviction. Our reporting has been cited in front of the court briefs so that you could feel one way about that. On the other hand, you could remind yourself that the same reason that you got into the story in the first place, power the prosecutor, same prosecutor could decide to try the case for a seventh time if that happens. And Curtis Flowers could still be executed or just spend the rest of his life in limbo. So the reason to do the story can't be because there needs to be an outcome or else I'm not in it. 
On the other hand, you'd be, I, I just can't imagine like thinking of myself solely as like a, a gatherer of like bits of information and like here you have right. them and do with one what you will. I mean, I think that we're making too many editorial choices in our storytelling about what matters and about what the story is to be able to just say that we're like really, we're not releasing spreadsheets. Yeah, um. yeah. I mean, I, 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 I don't expect any story I do to actually make change. <laughs> I just expect the story that I do to like give people the tools that change is possible, right? Well, and it's interesting, like what Manuel was saying earlier about rage walking, because this is such a thing. This is like when people listen, it's, it can be frustrating when people say like the main impact of this was that I got really angry. You know, it's like congratulations. But don't you think that that like? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess the, the question least. I had though is that like, um, do you guys remember that movie Inception? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a great movie, like really yeah. good movie. But 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 like the whole idea of the movie is planting a seed in this guy's brain so that he doesn't even realize that like it has changed his perception of the world and changes what he wants to do, and he goes out and he does something that he normally wouldn't do if that seed wasn't planted. And so for me, I think about the work that you guys do, and like, yeah, people may walk really hard and be angry about it, but I'm curious, like, if, um, if they see a progressive um, uh, district attorney running who says he's gonna change the whole system or whatever, and they've been listening to the reporting that you two have done, suddenly they, like, that seed gets a little bit of water and it begins to break up something and grow. I shouldn't be so negative, because what I should say is we get contacted all the time from people who, who say... Who want to do something. Yeah, or who have just never thought about this before. Like, season one was about how police often fail to solve crime and how the sheriff is an elected official who you vote for. And people, like, one woman emailed me and said, like, First of all, I never thought about sheriffs before at all. Secondly, I like Google my sheriff. I found out my sheriff's name. Third, turns out there's a sheriff's debate taking place this evening, which I'm going to go to because I guess we're in the middle of an election. You know? <laughs> and so, like, I mean, I think, like, you know, it's that's like thank change. You. That's, that's change. change. Yeah, that is change. And, like, it multiplied is. many times, you right. know, I mean, just as an example, or people contact us all the time, our data reporter will to ask how they can get the data for their place that they saw in the dark. So, you know, how can I find out what my district attorney is doing? Or how can I find out whether my cops are solving crimes? And then we work with people. These aren't usually journalists, just people like living someplace want to know. And we help them try to find those answers. Emmanuel, thank you. Uh, I mean, I don't have a bunch more to add, but I don't know. I just think to the interviews that I've seen really great journalists do, that I love so much, right? Just like, especially TV journalists. I was talking to someone about this, how like TV anchors, it's so much of their reaction actually matters. <laughs> like how the question they're asking, when they're asking, like the best TV anchor that you like is someone who asked the question you're thinking about the exact moment you want it to be asked in the exact way you want it to be asked. And I feel like what's so depressing and what I feel like we've seen a lot in terms of our own coverage in these last two years of this administration is sometimes we won't always even be asking the question. We won't be asking it at the right time. We won't be stating the fact. And we just might not ask it at all. And I think one of the small things, and maybe it's pathetic, but I, I try to like, tell myself before I go to bed at night to make myself feel better about things, is just that like, at least in our reporting, we're asking the question. Like, somebody somewhere, like, it, it, who, whether, you know, they are, like, a voter or, like, a citizen or, like, a bureaucrat or somebody is hearing that question being asked. A lot of times a question that maybe they haven't thought of themselves. Um, one of the most gratifying, uh, like, pieces of communication I had was actually with somebody who vehemently disagreed with us. Um, he was the police union chief um, for, um, for Cleveland. Um, we actually had like a six hour interview with him in which like he just went off the rails at us about like all these things we were wrong on or he felt we were wrong on. And it was really gratifying at the end of our reporting to talk to him to see that, yeah, he's definitely still a police union chief. <laughs> he's not going to like agree with like the things that we pointed out or some of the systemic problems. But like he felt like our reporting was fair. He felt like he was like, oh, you guys totally did your due diligence. You did, un you did unearth some truths about like, the way in which our system works. And you made me think about some things that I've not thought about. Um, and that, for me, I think is, is just a little. I just want people who are used to operating in these large systems to think about what it is that they're doing just a little bit harder, just a little bit more. So I'm going to put you on the side of you want to make change. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I mentioned earlier that I, I want to participate in the mainstream media in good faith and hopefully save this horrible brand that we've got right now because it's it's doing badly. Like the, uh, so I think uh, I, A. G. Salzberger, who's our publisher at the Times. He's been quoting this a lot lately, that 72% of Republicans polled recently said that they would rather get their news from the president than the mainstream media. And like, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, how can we re-engage people who do not trust us? And so that's one part of it. And, and then on the other part, and I think you, you hear the undertones of this in Caliphate, um, while I'm not an activist, but I, um, I am a journalist, and I do think that there's a difference, and we got to be mm -hmm. okay. careful about that. Like, there is an underlying message there that there is a cost to mischaracterizing the people who you think of as your enemy and making a bunch of assumptions about their character, their motivation, who they really are. And if that's true about Al Qaeda and ISIS, it's true about people who vote differently than you. It's true about people who, like you, have maybe for good reason come to think little of. Um, people are complicated. And the work of journalism, I believe in part, is to, to, to show people just how their assumptions about others are often wrong. And that, a, Curiosity, uh, engaging in the world with curiosity instead of quick snap judgments is essential for like democracy. It's essential for, for, for living the way that we all want the world to be. And like that's, that's, that's in there in each turn. I think that is a great place to transition and let the audience ask some questions. So uh, there is a microphone there and there. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll direct them to you right there. In the green shirt. Hi, thanks. It's been great. Um, I want to push a little bit at what you've all been for the last 10 minutes kind of talking about, which is, um, and this is not a question particular to podcasts, although I think the intimate nature of, you know, mainlining the information right into your ears, <laughs> I think makes it a more, even more urgent question which is um, how do you think about, or do you think about, the possibility of actually suggesting in a really concrete way to listeners what they might actually do if w the story you've just told, the people you've just introduced me to, the, the thing you've made me want to rage walk about, um, not everybody knows how to translate that into something that might mean change. And like I said, this is a question you could be asking about journalism from day one, you know, but I do think podcasting po presents that possibility maybe more than other mediums, media. And so I just like to know if, if you think about that or you kind of feel, and I don't mean this callously, but like that's not your job. I think for, in our first season, we did a lot of reporting on sex offenders and I thought about it in a different way there, where there was a lot of reporting you know, 30 years ago about sex offenders that led to sex offender registries, where the journalism led to impact, and the impact is now something that is trying to be undone by a lot of people in public policy circles. So it always, to me, is like a cautionary tale around saying, like, my story found this, therefore this should happen, and I'm positive of that. Um, because like, when you start to get into public policy, you're not I would need to engage in like a secondary reporting project to figure out and become like that kind of person. So I just don't often feel qualified in that way to say that like I can predict the future and say that this is, you know, what should happen. And also I kind of say too like we I, we talk about this a lot on our team because people will say, you know, what can I do to help Curtis or what can I and it's like it's really not. I mean, that is never going to be our job to tell you what you can do to help Curtis, but also, you know, maybe this like uncomfortable like question that the listener has is something that, that will yield an answer for them. Like maybe this like, you know, and maybe this is a value of Twitter actually, you know, people like having these conversations online about like, well, what should I do about this? I don't know. And if we keep all that conversation to ourselves, it just doesn't seem, seem right. Like it seems very like know-it-all. Like I don't, 
I don't know how you're supposed to fix prosecutors in the United States. Like, I don't have like a secret plan that I'm not revealing, you know, that if I have, you know, but, but seriously, like, and I just don't, I think that the way that we get to that is through this like debate and legislation and whatever that ends up being. And so it's always hard for me, especially because the question is always so simple. Like, well, what would you do? It's like, the question is so hard. I, right. I, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's one of the things that came up in our group edits a lot, particularly towards the end of our season where you know, our editor, Ira Goss, would just be like, so what are you guys saying <laughs> about like, all of this? Like, what, is it that, what is it you're driving towards? Um, and I don't know. I think for us, the way we kind of segmented it was that we just thought about, well, who, is this for? who are we making this for? Like, every, tons of people are going to listen to this. But like, you know, what, are we, what is it that we're, we're trying to say to, to like, so many people? And we decided that the people that we were trying to talk to in particular were bureaucrats, like within the criminal justice system. So those people that we interviewed most of the time, you know, who, you know, would tell us things about the ways that they felt like the system could be changed but like didn't see like their own agency they didn't see how their own role in the system could like affect anything so i think with us like our hope specifically talking about our project was like well if we at least just shine a light to these people and show how their own agency how their own small interactions like affect these outcomes then that's a change that they can decide to make for themselves if they want to um, I, I think it is hard to be specific about things in the way you know, that Madeline just explained. Um, but I, I do think that like, we can say collectively, uh, and definitively sometimes in our reporting, when something isn't working. And that acknowledgement, just that acknowledgement is something that, to be honest, people weren't willing to acknowledge within the criminal justice system in Cuyahoga County. People weren't willing to acknowledge this thing that we all assume to be true, which is that our criminal justice system doesn't work. Um, and I think just, just hammering that home was, was enough for us in terms of a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Andy? I, think, I mean, that's pretty, yeah. yeah that was good answers. Uh, question right over here. Hi, uh, I'm Luis, and uh, my question has to do with sort of, I'm curious about what your newsroom looked like when you were sort of discussing the narrative arc of these stories, because I think about the newsrooms I've worked in and they don't really look brown. Um, they don't look queer. They don't look female a lot of the times too. So I'm kind of curious, how did you um, sort of, what was the internal dialogue in the newsrooms when telling these stories and how did you sort of cross, like, you know, tell, like pick the pieces of the story that you would tell and reflect the community in the way that you wanted to, to reflect it? Sorry, sorry. Are, you, are you saying like it's it's a question of representation, like like um, like how do you tell these stories without those people being in the room? Um, it, I, I mean, I'm not sure how your newsrooms look like, so maybe let me know too how that is. But um, yeah, I'm just curious about this sort of dialogue. Like, how do the, how do you like when you're telling a community that you're not a, par a story of a community that you're not a part of, or you know, a lot of the people in the room don't look like you, or like look like the people you're telling stories on, like. How did those conversations look like in your newsroom? And yeah, One thing that we do is we have group sound edits where we bring in people who don't know anything about the story at all. So um, they don't know that we're looking at a death penalty case or anything like that. And so and we do that for a bunch of reasons. But And we bring in people with all sorts of different ways that they might hear this story, um, like big ways, you know, like someone who's not interested in the criminal justice system at all. Like, how are they going to react to this thing? That's, you know, but also, you know, somebody who maybe has like a closer tie to what this story is about versus someone who is pretty foreign to. Um, and so I think that's one way that, because, you know, our audience is like odd audiences, you know, it's like, so it's always a challenge to figure out like who, how do you, you're not just talking to one group of people, you know, and so and so I think sometimes a group sound edit can really reveal the ways in which you're speaking more to one person than another. Something's landing some way that it shouldn't, you know, things like that. Just practically speaking. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I, I talked a little bit earlier about how I was the only full-time like black journalist like on Serial, um, but I was lucky in that I had black producers that our sister show, This American Life, and and that I could pull in. I mean. Even within that, I found that sometimes we weren't quite cornering it enough. Like, I'm black, but like, 
I was born in England, and my family moved around a lot, and I wound up in Ohio in high school, right? But even when I lived in Ohio, which is where like, our season takes place, like, I came from a relatively middle-class background. So although I was like, I knew people who'd gone through the criminal justice system, and I had friends or whatever, like, I was not in it in a way that like, I possibly could have been. And I feel like there's always going to be, to a point, a certain level where you have to kind of do an audit and acknowledge your blind spots and just say, well, I, this is what I don't know, and maybe I don't know what I don't know. And I feel like you know, all of us, when we're reporting stories, you, know, you might end up in periods where you're a little out of your depth. And so that means, yes, bringing people into group edits um, from like, around your company or whatever. That also might mean just like doing like actual contextual reporting. Um, you know, Madeline, I know that you lived, you relocated to Mississippi, you went to like community events, you were living there as a member of that community. So it was I, I know you went to those zones, community like doing the work to make sure that you have a sense for what is normal for the people in your story, I think is just basic reporting, right? Mm -hmm. You want to do your due diligence, you want to call on background of the record, on the record to make sure that you know what you're talking about. Um, and I feel like for those areas where we didn't know enough, we just tried to do as much of that as possible. Um, but the other thing too is just like pushing to bring people in. Like we would push, I pushed like so the serial to like, well, hey, if I want to have black people listen to this, I don't want to have them listen to it for free. Can we pay people <laughs> to like listen to this draft that like we're doing um, as opposed to just dragging them from their work? I think things like that go like a long way. Um, yeah. Questions? Hands? I'll just, I'll just add one more thing. I'll just say Sorry, this. Andy. Just because like, I, I have a weird part of this where it's like, on the one hand, the whole reason to become a reporter is to go and report on people not like you. Like, that's like, I grew up in a town of 900 people, and I, once I saw the rest of the world, and I realized that you could get paid to go and try and see how they live and try better to help uh, bring attention to the beautiful, diverse experiences of being a human, or the sometimes awful experience of being human. Like that's like that's the whole game. And then it's on the balance of just like, make, like you were saying, like knowing uh, that uh, you are going to have these blind spots. But I do think that like so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, like I was always frustrated at how in the coverage of terrorists like the Islamic State, so little was written about the moments of. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the elements of belief and the role that belief played. And then I realized that almost all of them, reporters who were doing that, had never had a religious experience in their life. And I think I, it was helpful to be like, oh yeah, I remember, I remember having my own religious experiences and some of which I really regret now. Like, but they were powerful and overwhelming. Like it, 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 so it's a balance of, of like both, I think. You know, you know I, I would follow that up and say that we live in... Uh, a changing time and for news organizations that have not invested like I, I, I kind of hate the word like the idea of like diversity because what it sounds like it's like you're um, it sounds like you're bringing people in to be like sort of like tokens right like we need we need this guy and we need that guy for our room to look diverse and I would say that that's the wrong way to look at it that like what we should be thinking about is who are we talking to who are we talking about and that our newsrooms should reflect that. Our newsrooms should, like, if, we're, if we are, you know, a lot of us are reporters that are, or, or producers that are doing national work, like, you know, America is not just uh, this small little place that's filled with white people. America is a really big place. It has diverse backgrounds, diverse, uh, diverse ways of living, diverse people, all of that stuff. And so, like, if you're not, if you don't have a newsroom that reflects that, then you're not doing it right. And what's going to end up happening is that ultimately, organizations are going to get caught in really tough places when they don't have uh, a, a staff that can like stop something and say hey maybe that 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 no don't do that um, and so you know I think it's on all of us to think about like how we make the places that we are in uh, just and equitable as one of our funders loves to say right like how do we do that um, because it's not just about like what it looks like but it's about the storytelling that we're doing and who we're trying to tell and how we're trying to tell the story of America. And so it's extremely important. And so like, if you're working on these stories that you don't have that diverse newsroom, you have to think about like, how can I go outside of that and get that experience in the room? Um, 
And it shouldn't be a, a thing that you add on at the end. It should be a thing that you're thinking about through the entire process. If you're adding it on at the end, you failed that process. Um, Next question, if someone had their hand right, right over there, can we get a microphone there in the middle? Relay style. And she's got it. So this is, this is a question about Caliphate, which I will say I binged, which listened to. I thought you did an incredible job. And... One of the things that struck me, and it has to do with this question about what should we do, was how I felt by the end of that, my ideas that you know violence was always bad in this situation had shifted. I was more, you actually left me, and I'm kind of curious if this is wh where you guys were, in a rather ambivalent place about the situation. I mean, not only did I you know, get to know you know, that main character's name I cannot now remember, who joined and, you know, get to understand him. But by the end, I was less sure about what to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's what you intended. It's just how I walked away. And I wondered how you thought about it and how you dealt with mm -hmm. the sort of different sides of how to deal with the problem. Yeah, I, it's really hard. Like, what are we supposed to do? You know, uh, whether it's white nationalism and their attacks that we see in Christchurch or in Sri Lanka, like these things keep happening, and the root cause of them isn't something that you could you can you can kill quickly or easily. Um, it's it, it's definitely just a reflection of, of the situation I think that we're in. Um, Storytelling wise, um, it like we started off trying to understand better who the Islamic State is, recognizing, as we did at the beginning of the series, that for almost 20 years now, we've been fighting a war on terror, and there's more terror. Like, imagine if we had decided to fight a war on cancer, and there was just way more cancer. We, we, would, we would say we're in need of addressing the tools differently, and yet that's not the conversation around terrorism. There's, there, at least that's not the kind of big public conversation about terrorism. So I do think that, that, that what happens in the series is that you meet this guy and at one point he is so clearly he's saying to us I will never be back in that ideology I could never go back there I, I regret what I did and then it you know well what really happened is that I went back and I started to try and work with our team at making Caliphate into a thing and then we started this other show called The Daily and that was a lot of work and so I put it on the shelf and like a lot of time went by because we were making that every day, every day, every day but then like we grew the staff, more people now I can go back and turn to like making this other project again and by the time that we went to go and see like how is he doing now, it's been a year we found that in the time that I was busy, in the time that we were editing he had returned to the same sort of situations that led him to be recruited in the first place. He was lonely, he was feeling rejected, he hadn't found a new identity, and, and he was suddenly vulnerable to all these things. And so that just felt like we were gonna, like a lot of us, it's like hard to end a true story because they don't have clean endings. And that's we, where we just literally said goodbye to him in this moment of, of, of not being sure whether or not the, the, the person who we felt so sorry for and who we hoped the best for, not so sure that, that, that he was a safe person. I mean, it, it stays in this room. I mean, I guess people can watch it, but like we, when we went to go visit him that last time, he had scared us. He had been sending us troubling text messages, and it was a real security concern whether it was a good idea for us to go into a hotel room again with this guy, considering the things that he was saying and the beliefs that appeared he had gone back to. And that's heartbreaking, because we really thought that we were telling the story of a guy that got out. And it just shows that it's, it's a mess. You know. We have uh, time for one more question. Hi, so this question is going to be really short, and it's for Madeline. Um, what's the scanning technology that you guys <laughs> used? <laughs> It's a handheld scanner. The company's brother, Parker, the model number. Okay. We'll talk. We'll, we'll talk. talk later. Thank you. No, but the, what I would say just briefly about this is like what we did, which worked, was we were faced with exorbitant cop copying fees, and it turned out that like sometimes like the most like DIY, lo-fi way you can do it is best. So we just yeah, 
I really recommend a handheld scanner and just like finding a little space in a clerk's office somewhere that's not being occupied that you can use for like a year. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I, I wanted to follow up on one thing that Andy had just said and the question that was asked about like where should we leave uh, or, or how it left you or whatever. And I would say that like what each one of these podcasts did with their characters is that they made them complex human beings. And the stories were complex, and at times you don't know what to take or, or, or what not to. And I think that what has happened in our storytelling in America for as long as there's been in America to right now is that the only people that tend to get complexity are bad guys who are white, right? Like, we are willing to, like, think about, like, why did they end up doing this and how did they end up here? And if somebody did a, a shooting somewhere, like, oh, well, let's, like, research and see that he was hurt as a child and maybe that brings more empathy to him. And I think that what these three podcasts excelled at is the idea that, like, Everybody is complex, and everybody has these deep, rich histories that they bring to them in everything that they do. And the thing that we should be left with is that the human condition is complex from all of us, like everybody. And so like the, the ISIS person that, that we don't know and we other, like they have a complex story that brought them to that point. Um, and so what the hell do we do with that if everybody's complex and we can't color people as a simple bad guy and a simple good guy? I have no idea. <laughs> but that is the power of the intimacy of podcasting, is that we can go into places that normally we can't get into and have people ask these big questions. And hopefully, asking those big questions will give us answers that actually make change. Thank you all for coming to this, uh, this uh, session. Uh, thank you to Al and Madeline and Emmanuel and Andy. Uh, what an incredible set of podcasts and an incredible set of journalists. So thank you.